there is nothing like being together with the body of uh, Christ. And uh, that includes those joining us online. We're so glad that we have this option, thanks to technology, to be able to come together. And uh, we just want you guys to know that God has a word for you, whether you're at home or you're here, as we continue our Breaking Ground series. Today's message, we are at war. I know it seems kind of like a little militant, maybe, a little harsh, but let me nerd out for a second before we get into the word. How many of you guys have seen the new Spider-Man movie? Wow. Okay. No spoilers. I'm trusting that there's a bunch of you online that have seen it already. No spoilers. Don't worry. I'm not going to spoil it. But Spider-Man was my favorite guy. I had more comics growing up with Spider-Man than any of the other characters. I related with him down to earth, just like us, but he got bit by you know, a radioactive spider. But besides that, he was, he was just like us and facing the same problems that you and I face. And one of my favorite scenes in the uh, most recent Marvel movies was in Infinity War, when Peter Parker is on the bus and he's going to a, um, a field trip. And he has no idea that the mad titan Thanos is coming to destroy all half of all of the universe. He has no idea. He's just on a field trip. He's with his friends. He's a friendly neighborhood Spider-Man. He's not worried about galaxy issues. And he's not worried about, you know, giant aliens and all of that kind of stuff. He's just with his friends. And all of a sudden, I think we have the picture here, that the hair on his arms goes up. Now, who can tell me what that is? The spidey sense. Okay, I'm not the only one here that understands that part of the powers that he received from that, that bite was that he could sense danger was coming. And if you remember that scene at the beginning of Infinity War, he looks out the, uh, out the bus and he sees this massive spaceship coming down, starting to uh, wreak havoc on his city. And he says to his friend, Ned, cause a distraction, cause a distraction. And of course, the distraction was, oh my God! Right? And so all of the students run to the back and they're looking at that giant spaceship. Meanwhile, he jumps right out of the bus and he goes right into battle. From a field trip, like everything's fine, everything's normal to, well, if you've seen the Infinity War and Endgame, you understand he was in for the battle of his life. Now, I promise, I'm, that's, I'm not going to nerd out anymore on that. But when Marvel did this with Spider-Man, they became the most successful uh, franchise in the world. And that particular movie, Spider-Man um, No Way Home, has uh, globally made $1.5 billion. And uh, it ranks number eight in all-time movies. So I'm just saying, if you haven't seen it yet, you should go see it. But the point is not go see Spider-Man. The point is that in that same moment where Peter Parker was on his way to do a normal thing and then realized we're at war and he didn't even realize it, everyone else on this bus is just going about their daily business. When Jesus used mediums, like stories, to get his audience's attention, he had the same effect. And the, and the parable that we're about to read you might not describe as hair raising. But I'm praying that you will have an awakening just like Peter Parker did in that moment where we realize we have to get off the bus and into the war. That there's something going on around us whether we want to admit it or not, whether we want to acknowledge it or not, because we are at war. And Jesus, uh, obviously he wouldn't use uh, computer graphics or any of those kind of things or film, but he used stories. And it caught the attention of his heart. And his, his audience was mostly agrarian. You know, they're from a farmer's uh, culture. And so he would tell a story that absolutely appealed to them. And this is a hair-raising story called The Parable of the Sower. And let's find out what this was all about. Luke chapter 8, verses 4 through 5. If you want to follow along in your paper notes, in fact, I'd encourage you specifically, because I'm going to have you write down some things at the end. I printed out some extra paper notes in these on these tables around here. There's pins there as well. I'd encourage you to grab those. We also, if you uh, want to save a tree, you can also take notes on our app. If you're at home and you don't have, obviously you're at home, I take uh, get that app out, the Free Father's House app, and follow along on there. So Luke chapter 8, 4 through 5. Would you guys read this with me out loud? Ready? Go. While a large crowd was gathering... And people were coming to Jesus from town after town. He told this parable. 
A farmer went out to sow this seed, and as he was scattering the seed, some fell along the path. It was trampled on, and the birds ate it up. So this is just the first of four rock uh, soils that he's going to describe. Everybody, again, in a farmer's culture, they're all leaning in like, oh, we know all about hard soil. And that's the soil that's around the crops that people are walking over constantly. That's the soil that that horses would ride over constantly, that if there's a chariot, that that's going to be riding over constantly. So that, that's the way that you get around the fields and into town. Everybody knew all about the hard soil, so they're, they're all leading in. And, and if you are familiar with this parable, as many of us are, you know that there's four soils that Jesus is about to talk about. The first is the hard, the next is the shallow, the next is the weedy soil, and then the good or soft soil. Some of the best advice I was ever given by a good friend of mine said this, when you're reading the parable of the sower, don't assume you're the good soil. Because immediately we're like, well, that's definitely the person next to me, not hard soil, definitely not the person that's not me. I'm, I'm, I'm the good soil. We, we immediately go to, well, the hardened soil must represent a uh, you know, hardened heart, and it does. But let's not just assume that if we have a relationship with Jesus, that there hasn't been some hardening of our heart lately. So as we hear about God's heart for the hard soil on this Sunday, we'll be unpacking the rest of the soils over the next couple of weeks. Let's go ahead and understand he might be talking about us. So let's understand what this parable is talking about. You have the seed, you have the sower, and you have the soils. In this parable, because the parable is representing kingdom truths, the seed represents the scripture or the word of God that he's, he's going to be taking and spreading over the ground. And the soil represents our souls. And the sower, of course, it represents Jesus, our Savior. And so no matter how much you put seed on this hard soil, you can, can you guys see that? It's, I don't know if you can see it online, but it's literally just bouncing off. It doesn't matter how many sermons you hear. It doesn't matter how many uh, times you go to conferences, how much of the word of God you read. If the seed <coughs> represents God's word or scripture, it doesn't matter how much of it you hear, read, uh, journal on, whatever. It's always going to bounce off. It's never going to take root. And the Savior gives us, because he loves us so much, is going to give us multiple opportunities and exposures to the Word of God because the Word is living and active and it changes us. And when that seed can actually take root, that's when we see growth in our life. But if we've got a hardened heart, if our soil of our soul is hard, it doesn't matter how excellent this message is, right? And everyone said, Amen. Amen. <laughs> Hey, absolutely. Wow, wow, I see how it is. No, um, it doesn't matter how good, because even Charles Spurgeon, the great, one of the best known preachers ever, and I've talked to you guys about him before, he's one of my heroes, and uh, and he he talked about how in, in his sermon when he was preaching in London at the Metropolitan Baptist Tabernacle in, uh, back in 1852, 20,000 people every Sunday would gather for 20 years. And this is what he said about this parable. He said, your business is to preach to all of them, to proclaim the gospel to the whole creation. And if there happens to be some who prove to be like the hard path to the good seed, effectively resisting the gospel, it's still necessary that they should be in the audience. So Spurgeon, one of the best preachers and pastors in all of Christendom history, he said, we want all the soils in the house. We don't just want one. We don't just want, we're not just going to focus on the good ones. We want even the hardest part, right? We want the ones that if they say, man, I can't come to church. If I come to church, lightning's going to strike me down, right? We all have, we all, we have friends like that. They're like, I can't come to church. There's no way, right? I, I, there's no way I'm going to come. There's no way God would allow me to even walk into a church building. And here's Spurgeon going, no, we need to. And it was so interesting, and I shared this a little before, so I'm not going to go into great detail on this part of the story, but sometimes you have to get outside of your context in order to see back into your context. And I had a chance to go to London for my master's cohort just for a couple of days, and I got to actually go to Spurgeon's church. And it's just it was just an amazing thing. I got to go inside, and um, 
Unlike Spurgeon's passion to reach the lost, and he led like his generation to the Lord. Uh, the elder that was there now trying to keep things going, he had a real heart for the Lord, but he was really discouraged. He gave us the tour, kind of, you know, showed us around, you know, the, the statue and the pews and, and all, all of that kind of stuff. There, you know, there's, there's my man Spurgeon right there. And uh, he showed us all around, but he, when we sat down, I and my uh, cohort um, of mostly pastors, he just said, hey guys, uh, we're in trouble here in, in England. We're, we're in trouble. Uh, and and I, I think Christianity is on, and this is his words, on its last legs. And he wasn't exaggerating. Each census shows, according to this uh, article here that I read in the London Telegraph, each census shows the collapse of religion to be the biggest single social trend in Britain, even bigger than Brexit. As atheism and apathy combine, the most recent surveys show that 70% of 16 to 29 year olds in the UK identify themselves with no religion and just 7% call themselves Anglican, which is the, the Church of England. And when I looked at that and I heard his heart, I understood how discouraged he was. And here's what you and I need to know, that's not just happening in England. That's happening here. In fact, uh, most sociologists would say that Europe, uh, America is only about 10 years behind Europe in terms of the sociological trends. I literally just read a survey about how Protestantism, which has been by far over the last few decades, the highest number and the growing number, it's declined rapidly over these last couple of years for the first time. That we're a part of the Protestant believers or people of faith and he just said, you know what, I, I, it's impossible to reach these people. He was just being really honest with us as a pastor to a bunch of pastors. It, it's a bunch of atheists, agnostics, Muslims, young people. You know those young people. What are you going to do with them? They don't pay any attention. They're always looking at their screens. Right? Right, guys? Okay. And, then he get, and then he says, oh, and, and then people who play instruments. And I'm like, wait, what? Yeah, those churches, those churches that play instruments, they're far from the Lord. And of course, we're, we're all church pastors of churches that play instruments. And apparently, and I had to go back and look at this, apparently, he, Spurgeon, did not like instruments. Sorry, Josh, no, no offense. Uh, he, Spurgeon, you know, I think he would have loved your heart, but he didn't like the fact that you, uh, you played an instrument here on Sunday because he felt it was a distraction. But here's what I love about Spurgeon. He, he acknowledged other people are going to do that, and that's fine. I'm going to focus on the way that God has asked me to do it, and we're going to keep reaching people. But here I found myself on the list of unreachables. According to this pastor that was now at Spurgeon's church, where 20,000 people every Sunday were coming, now it's like largely empty. It's mostly just a memory of what once was. And here's this pastor with a, with a heart that's breaking, but also you could tell it was rather hard for a whole list of people that he didn't think were ever going to come to Christ. And now I found myself on the list because I happened to play an instrument. And I remember just walking out of that, that time so discouraged. My God, what's going on here in Europe? What's going on here in England, in the UK? And that same day we went to go climb St. Charles Cathedral, which is 360 feet high. And there's, it's 800 stairs if you want to get to the top viewing section. And I was like good at 300 stairs. I don't know about you, but I'm like, you know what, I can just look at pictures. Three out 300, I'm like. <laughs> Gloria, this is amazing. Can we go get lunch now? You know, and I just felt like this thing inside of my heart. It's like, John, you need to go to the top. And I'm like, oh, gosh, 500 stairs. <laughs> Right, and I'm all asthmatic, right? And everyone's going going by me. I'm like, hey, tell me how it is up there. Just maybe take a couple pictures. I'll, I'll take a look at it. And again, I just felt like, no, you need to go all the way to the top. So finally, I'm like crawling, and I finally get to the top. I took this with my phone. <clears throat> and I just felt like the Lord said, when you're on the ground for too long, you lose perspective. Sometimes you need to come up and see things the way I see them. And as I looked out over London, I began to pray for the church, uh, the Metropolitan Tabernacle, for that elder that I just heard whose heart was, was hardened and uh, hurt. I began to pray for the churches in England, and, and then I began to pray for the churches in America. 
And I just felt like the Lord was saying, I need you to see things the way I do. You think you're at peacetime. But John, you're at war. You're walking around like everything's fine. And I need you to go to a war for souls. And that's the perspective that I'm praying that God would give us, those watching online right now. And here's the thing that I want us to understand first and foremost is that we're at a we're at war. We are. But it's a war for sinners, not with sinners. You can fill that in your first blank. We are at war for sinners, not with sinners. You see, that elder had been doing this for so long that he now saw himself as separate from the very people that God had called him to reach. And if you and I aren't careful, we're going to find ourselves at war with the very people he's called to reach. Romans 3.23 says, All have sinned and fallen short of the glory of God. All have sinned. We're in that category of, of hardened soil, apart from any work of the Holy Spirit. We're right here, and the seeds of God's word are bouncing right off. All have sinned and fallen short of the glory of God. If not for salvation, you and I wouldn't even be able to receive the word that I'm sharing right now. The disciples pull Jesus aside and they're like, what does this mean? And Jesus explains the parable, Matthew 13, 18 through 19. Listen to what the parable of the sower means. When anyone hears the message about the kingdom and does not understand it, the evil one comes and snatches away what was sown in their heart. This is the seed sown along the path. So it's not just a quaint tale about a farmer with bad aim, apparently. This has the disciples' hair standing on end because they understood when he talks about the evil one, he's saying we are at war with someone who is after the souls of the people that you and I know and love. Again, the birds come down. The evil one comes and snatches away the seeds that were sown because they had no time to take root. That evil one, known as the prince of the power of the air, is none other than the devil. Now, speaking of another movie, I don't know if you guys have seen The Usual Suspects. But Kaiser Soze, the whole time, is the evil one right in front of them, and they have no idea. And he says the greatest trick the devil ever played was convincing the world that it didn't exist. Poof. He's gone. And I wonder sometimes if as Christians, even as a pastor, if we don't fall for that trick, that, yeah, maybe there is a devil, but that has nothing to do with my daily life. And Jesus, from the very first illustration, the very first soil, he's like, you need to understand we're at war for this soil right here. Everyone else would look at that soil and go, what? Who would want that? Nothing's going to grow there. And yet Jesus is saying, no, no, don't give up on that because that was you. That was me. And yet you and I, if we're not careful, we find ourselves actually opposing the very ones that God has called us to reach because we are at war with the wrong person. We're at war with our neighbors and our friends and our coworkers and our bosses because they're just a bunch of sinners. And yet Paul says very clearly off of what Jesus was talking about in Ephesians 6, 11 through 12, who we're actually at war with. Put on the full armor of God. We're at war, so you better put on your armor so that you can take your stand against it's literally the word facing. So you can face who? Your atheist co-worker? Your agnostic friend? Hmm? Someone that is politically opposite from you? And who are we supposed to, who are supposed to fight? No, against the devil's schemes. This word here is literally the craftiness or sleight of hand like when a magician says, look over here and the real trick is happening over here. We're supposed to take a stand against the devil's schemes. He's a, he's a trickster. He's a magician. And he has us all confused because we're all over here looking at this and he's really doing the worst stuff against the very people that we've been called to fight for and instead we're fighting against because he says for our struggle is not against flesh and blood. Not against flesh and blood. Hey, listen, I, I know how hard it is to get to church sometimes. I know how sometimes the worst arguments happen right before you're going to go to church or on the way to church. I know so many times that's happening. And, and, and you and I sit here and we need to be understanding that our spouse and our kids are flesh and blood. They are not our enemies. 
right? No matter how much sometimes it feels like they are. No matter how much it's like, I'm going to prove to them that I'm right. We're fighting the wrong battle if we're fighting flesh and blood. That is not our fight. The person next to you is not your enemy. Go ahead and tell them. You're not my enemy. Yeah, go ahead and tell them. Yeah. I'm pretty sure everyone there is flesh and blood. You online? Yep, I'm pretty sure you're sitting next to flesh and blood as well. The IRS agent is not your enemy. I remember preaching out of this passage once and I said that an, uh, an IRS agent came up to me afterwards and she's like, I'm an IRS agent. And I said, you need a hug, don't you? Because <laughs> they get it. No one likes them. And they're not our enemy. Think about the, the worst person, the person that votes exactly the wrong way from you, the, the person that argues with you about everything, the person that doubts your beliefs or attacks your beliefs. None of them are our enemy. But against the rulers, against the authorities, against the powers of this dark world, against the spiritual forces of evil and the heavenly realms. You see, if we're not careful, we become just like that elder in Spurgeon's church where our heart for the lost and the broken and the hardened, we lose it. And the very hands that were meant to bring the gospel of Jesus are actually pounding the very ones we're supposed to be praying for. Let me ask you this question. Does the ground get harder or softer with more pounding? It's hardened, right? That's how it got hardened in the first place. But does, does the ground get harder or softer with more trampling? Interesting. The very hands that were supposed to bring hope bring hurt. The very ones that were supposed to be helping to soften the soil of the soul are the ones that, if we're not careful, are hardening it because we're fighting the wrong enemy. We're supposed to take a stand against the schemes of the devil, and I think one of his most successful schemes is the fog of war, where we actually end up shooting and hurting the very ones we're supposed to be fighting with and fighting for. I don't like how you vote. I don't like how you dress. I don't like where you live. I don't like what you drink. I don't like what you smoke. Boom, 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 boom. And is that really? How is that going to make the ground any softer for the reception of God's word? It doesn't. And yet this is mostly what the world knows, is what we're against, instead of the fact that we're supposed to be for them. They see us like this, instead of like this. And I just, I just feel like the Lord is saying, hey, don't, don't fall for the enemy's schemes. You're, you're doing all the work for them. The devil just sits back. Because the more that we pound the sinners in our life, the more we forget we were sinners too. And the more we push away the very ones that God wants to use our lives to call close, we're at war for sinners, not with sinners. And oh my goodness, it's been so divisive in our world. Everything is so polarized. And we look at people with such vitriol because of the stuff that they post or they think or they say, and we forget that just underneath that is a soul and a soul <coughs> that Jesus died for. The point isn't winning arguments. It's winning souls. We're at war for sinners, not with them. Secondly, this war for souls won't be won in a day, but it will be won daily. It won't be won in a day, but it will be won daily. There's, there's some that you've been, been praying for and you've given up on. Like, they're never going to change. There's some of you who are like, I've, I've invited these people to come to church with me like 500 times. Never going to happen. Let me, let me tell you, it might not be a church that they need. They might just need you to not give up on them. They might just need one person who sees the soil just under the heart of the heart. Do you understand that the worst thing that we can do is trample on the ones who've already been trampled on? We live in a world that loves to keep people when they're down. Let's not let that be true of us. Just underneath this hardened heart is a heart that is crying out for someone to see that there's something worthwhile in them. Maybe that someone is us. Maybe we can see what others are missing. Paul goes on to say, here's how you fight. For a war, here's how you fight. Therefore, put on the full armor of God so that when the day of evil comes, you may be able to, what? Stand your ground. And after that, you have done everything 
after you've done everything. You've prayed for them, you've witnessed to them, you've brought them, tried to bring them to church, you've had them over for dinner, and after you've done everything, walk away. Oh, no. What does it say again? Notice how he says that twice. What kind of a strategy is that? That is a strategy that's so simple and yet so effective. It says, I will not give up on you because God did not give up on me. I'm going to stand here on this ground until God takes me home so that there's at least one person standing on your behalf. Jesus did that for us, and it calls us to do that for others. No matter how hard that ground is, we will stand our ground for them. How long do I have to stand until the ground changes? You think that the Savior, when that blood poured out from his sacrifice on the cross, did that pour in soft ground? Well, that, was, that was the hardest hearts you'd ever seen. They were literally shouting, Crucify him. Oh yeah, your God? Go ahead and prove yourself. Come down from that house. Call down your angels, which you could have done any of those things. And yet, what does he say? I'm going to show you guys how wrong you are. No, he says, Father, forgive them, for they don't know what they're doing. Jesus stood his ground by laying down his life for the hardest of hearts, so that not only that generation, but this generation would have an opportunity to know him, to, to let that seed take root. Sometimes the greatest strategy we have right now it's just stay put. Don't leave. Don't go. Don't run. Stay. When you've done everything else, what should you do? Stay. Yeah. It's not going to happen in a day, but it will happen daily. According to uh, U-Haul, they reported last week that California remained the top state for out-migration. Anybody surprised? No. Want to talk about hardened ground? Where do you think I got this ground from? <laughs> yeah, this is California soil right here. <laughs> and we all have a whole lot of reasons, a list of them. Just like that elder in the tabernacle, Spurgeon's Church had a whole list of reasons why this is only going to get worse. Christianity is on its last leg. California is going to hell in a handbasket, and I'm not going with them. I'm out of here. Right? Everybody has a whole bunch of good reasons why. But what if the strategy that God is telling us now, well, you all literally ran out of trucks. They did, according to this article. A new report released on Monday revealed more than 600,000 people have left New York and California during the pandemic. No surprise. But if everyone leaves, who's standing? If everyone runs, who's fighting? I know it's not easy, an easy assignment. But the best battles are won by a few who say this ground is worth fighting for. And almost an answer to that prayer that I prayed looking over London, the day before I left, I got to go to Holy Trinity Brompton. And I got to hear from Vicka, Nikki Gumble. Don't you just love that Vicka? It's so much it sounds so much cooler than Pastor. Uh, Vicka, uh, Nicky Gumbel, and he just began to talk about how they were celebrating the Alpha Groups. I don't know if you guys have ever heard about Alpha Groups, but it's an, an informal, friendly, and fun course that is uh, basically 20 years ago, evangelical Christianity in the UK was a fringe activity associated with a loony American cult. And today, 1.2 million Britons have attended an Alpha course. Thousands have come to know the Lord. The Alpha website is running in, it's running over 100 countries, 100 languages, 24 million people. It's run by Anglicans, Presbyterians, Lutherans, Baptists, Methodists, Pentecostals, Eastern Orthodox, Roman Catholics, all variations on the same material. The first course is this. Get, get this. It's super awesome. You get around the table, you eat, and then you talk through questions like, top one, Christianity, boring, untrue, and irrelevant, question mark. That's the that's the first one out of the gate. It's the, the point is literally, who do you invite? The point is literally to invite everyone that was on that elder is at the tabernacles list to invite all of them to actually come and sit around the table with you and eat. 
That's actually the point. Everyone that that elder said they're never going to come to Christ, those were the very ones that were on the invite list to come around the table and let's just go ahead and have a free and safe place where we can ask difficult questions about what it is we say we believe. When you're walking into Holy Trinity Brompton, that's a, a famous sculpture of the father embracing the prodigal son. If that doesn't tell you the heart of this church, I don't know what does. And I got to be there on that morning. I was so excited. It was, it was their water baptism. And they, had a, they had a baptism right in the, in the stage. And they brought up people that had gone through their alpha course. And they brought up a mother and a son. And the, and the mother got up first and she said, I got divorced from my husband and I will just be honest with you. I didn't want to just divorce him. I wanted to murder him. And I, I was like, oh, that's funny. And then I could, oh, she's not joking. She, she literally wanted to kill him. She had been so hurt and wounded by what this man did and how he had cheated on her. And she, her heart was so hard that she just wanted to not just divorce this guy, she wanted to kill him. And then she said, so I, then I went to an alpha course. And over the course of six weeks, I found Christ. I was baptized in the Holy Spirit. And now all I can do is pray that my husband will have the same experience as I did, my ex-husband. And standing next to or was her, her son. And this blew me away even more. He just said, I just, I don't believe in Jesus. I'm not even sure where I'm at with God. But I see what God did with my mom. So it makes me want to find out more. I was so thankful that she found this alpha group, that she found this church. And I'm ready to start asking questions. I'm like barely holding it together because are you kidding me? That there's a church context where someone can get up in front of the church and say, yeah, I don't really believe what you guys believe, but I'm willing to find out more because I've seen the fruit in my mom's heart and heart. Whoa. So by the way, if that's a group that you would be interested in helping facilitate, an alpha group, come talk to me. Because that's my dream, is to see a bunch of those come up out of the Father's house. That's the kind of church that I want us, I want us to have here. But why don't we? Well, because our, heart, our hearts grow hard through impatience. You guys get a little uh, flower pun there? Let's just be honest. <laughs> I know you guys are shaking your head. I had to go there. We are, uh, we, instead of show, sowing the seed of God's word, we are sowing in patience. And we're just like, I'm so done waiting for you to change. Nothing's ever going to change. I'm done with this. I'm tired of waiting for you. And yet God says in his word, in 2 Peter 3, 9, the Lord isn't being slow about his promises. Some people think he's being patient for your sake. He doesn't want anyone to be destroyed, but wants everyone to repent. God literally puts heaven on hold. He's coming back for his church, make, make no mistake. But he puts heaven on hold for just one more, and here we are sowing in patience. I don't got time for this, God. But God had time for us. James 5, 7 through 9 says, Be patient then, brothers and sisters, until the Lord's coming. See how the farmer waits for the land to yield its valuable crop, patiently waiting for the autumn and spring rains. You too be patient and stand firm because the Lord's coming is near. Don't grumble against one another, brothers and sisters, or you will be judged. The judge. Who's the judge? Who, who's the judge? Okay, I'm just making sure we're all aware of who the judge is. Because I've seen a lot of judging, and it hasn't been God. <coughs> it's been mostly us with our gavel, running around, pounding people. That's wrong. That's bad. That's evil. Get away. I don't like you. But we're not the judge. It says he is. And he's standing at the door. We are at war. The first scheme of the enemy is the fog of war. If you want to, this is not in your notes, but the second scheme of the enemy is the, to uh, have us give up the fight. We're supposed to take a stand against his schemes. And we give up way too soon. Remember looking at this uh, tower. I, I think we have a picture of it. Yeah. A tower is a thousand years old in Oxford. Our country is barely over 200 years old. And we've already given up on our country? 
God said, I, while I was walking around, God said, look, look at that tower, John. I've been at work long before you were here, and I'm going to be at work long after you're gone, and you've already given up, and I'm just getting started. Right? right? How about that? That's what I mean. Sometimes we've got to get outside of our, our context, to look back into our context and realize, my goodness, everyone that's already given up on our country, and God is saying, what if the darkest time is the time when I'm about to move in the greatest possible way? What if the time when everyone else is getting ready to give up, I'm ready to release a fresh move of God? Just like he did in Spurgeon's day. Just like he's doing through Holy Trinity Brompton. What if God wants to do that through us? The third scheme of the enemy is friendly fire grumbling against each other. As it says here in James, be patient, stand firm, and don't grumble against one another. We're not only firing against the people we're fighting, supposed to be fighting for, we're firing against the people we're supposed to be fighting with. We're like attacking our brothers and our sisters because maybe some wear masks and some don't. Maybe some are vaxxed and some aren't. It's okay to get specific, right? Because I think God is. Like, we're, we're like mowing each other down, and the devil's just sitting back like, yeah, this is awesome. I'd like to do anything. You guys are fighting each other instead of fighting me. That's awesome. That's a great plan. That's a scheme of the devil, and we give into it. That pastor, that elder in that tabernacle, Spurgeon's church, he said, pray for us because we're invisible here. You see, as a group of pastors, we didn't all rise up and go, Here's the scriptural reasons why instruments are a part of worship. None of us did that. Why didn't we do that? Because we looked past whatever that hurt was, whatever the hardness of that heart was, and we saw somebody that was desperate to see a move of God. We didn't, decided to make the issue not the issue. We decided not to attack him, but instead to pray for him, and that's what we did. We all gathered around him, prayed for him in this church, even though we played instruments, and he doesn't like that. What if we did that too, for each other, as brothers and sisters, whether in this church or in that church? The fourth scheme of the enemy is prayer and praise don't change a thing. It's a, it's a funny thing that we're asked to do, but God has given us a strategy. James puts it this way, is anyone among you in trouble? Let them pray. Is anyone happy? Let them sing songs of praise. Is anyone among you sick? Let them call the elders of the church to pray over them and anoint them with oil in the name of the Lord. And the prayer offered in faith will make the sick person well. The Lord will raise them up. If they have sinned, they will be forgiven. Whoever turns, that's that cultivating of the hard ground, a sinner from the error of their ways will save them from death and cover a multitude of sins. The enemy wants to convince you that your prayers are never heard and that your praise is a waste of time. Why? Because he knows that that's how we do battle. Praise softens. Prayer deepens. Praise softens our heart first so that we can begin to see the breakthrough in our heart and begin to see that breakthrough in others. And then prayer digs deeper so that we can begin to see growth happening in our life so that we believe that growth can happen in the lives of those around us. Prayer, praise and prayer, they seem ridiculous. Like, what are you doing talking into the air? What you, why, why do you guys even do this? Right? Our, our brains, our logic just goes, this is not doing anything. And yet we just read in James, actually, this is doing a whole bunch. It's softening you so that we can see God soften others. You guys have some people that you really don't like in your life. Can I just challenge you during this 21-day fast to pray for them? And have God give you his heart for them. People that you've given up on. He's just getting started with. And I, I want you guys to write on those notes there. We're only one week into our 21 day fast. I want you guys to write some names down. People that you've given up on. And I want you to put it like in your Bible or on your fridge or something like that. That over the next two weeks of our fast. We're going to be praying and fasting for them, for the hardest people in your life, the people with the hardest ground. Let's start praising and praying over them. 
I want you to write those names down on your notes or in your phone if you're, if you're not on your phone. And I want us to commit to the next two weeks all we're going to do. Every time they come up in our brain, every time we, we think about that last argument that we have, every time we think about how much they hurt us, we're just going to lift them up before the Lord. And we're going to let God begin to soften our hearts for them so that we can be a part of Him softening their hearts for the Lord. Let's pray. If you guys would bow your heads and close your eyes. Maybe someone, maybe a few of us in here will go ahead and admit that out of the soils there's some hardness of heart. There's some places where we have turned away from God. Or maybe we don't even really know Him as our personal Lord and Savior. If that's you, this is the first step. Jesus has such a heart for you. All you have to do is acknowledge your need for him and his forgiveness. So if you're here now and you want to receive Jesus as your Lord and Savior, or you want to come back to him after a long time away, I just want to agree in prayer with you. With every head bowed and every eye closed. If you just raise your hand right now, I'd love to agree in prayer with you right now. Say, I need to come to the Lord. Yeah, I see that hand. Thank you so much. Anyone else? I need to come to the Lord or I need to come back to the Lord. Just raise your hand right now so I can agree with you in prayer. Yeah, I see that hand back there. Thank you so much. Anyone else? It's going to give one more moment. That's what this moment is here for. It's for you. He loves you so much calling you to himself. Anyone else? If you guys would just pray together with me, you can repeat after me, but I want you to pray to the Lord as the worship team comes up. Heavenly Father, repeat after me. Heavenly Father, thank you for sending Jesus. Jesus, thank you for coming for me. Thank you for dying for me. Thank you for taking my sin and my shame upon yourself. I don't deserve it. I can't earn it. I just know I need it. So I receive it. Your forgiveness. Your grace. Softening my heart and heart. So I can walk with you. From this day forward, I belong to you. And I pray this prayer so that I can hear it. So those around me can hear it. So even the devil can hear it. But most of all, that you would know you are my Lord, my Savior, and my life belongs to you. In the name of Jesus. Amen. Can we just celebrate those that have come to know Christ, guys?